always on. How have you been, brother? Inshallah, you've been well. Alhamdulillah, how's your family? Inshallah, you had a nice Eid? Yeah, we have a nice Alhamdulillah. Oh, Sayyid, by the way, do you uh, do you recognize these books like from Al Kisa Foundation? So I'm familiar with Al Kisa Foundation. Yeah. Steps to perfection. Yeah. I haven't seen this particular book. Oh. Mashallah. So Mashallah. because that's what uh, we have been started here from Sunday school. Okay, yeah, you're so using this. Uh, there, I do know their work is really good. Yeah, yeah. Mashallah, they produce quality books for children. Yeah, yeah, so the fact that you're using that, that's very good. Yeah, this is what we are using. For the Sunday school? Yeah, here. Yeah. Mashallah, mashallah. How many students do you have? One student is present here, Taki Kissa. Uh, the fourth student, sir. Four students. Four students. Okay, and this Sunday, we are going to conduct exam, by the way. Oh, we have finished this book. Mashallah, are you one of the teachers? Yeah, we know, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 Inshallah, Moha Mubarak Khubud Inja. Alhamdulillah. Salawat for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali. Kushmadiye Imam e Zamana Balandar Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali. Mahar Habibi Khuda Khatim e Lambiya Balandar Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali. Muhammad. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Today uh, we will be starting our program uh, with our salam done by uh, Dr. Uh, Ali Nafi. So I'd like to call him up to the front so he can recite it. Kaha jaye aake baya baye haru su shikasta hai pehlu akeli hai zehra rone pe pehra masayab ka sehra akeli hai zehra akeli hai zehra dar e fatima ko jalaya hai tumne kiya vaada apna bhulaya hai tumne dar e fatima ko jalaya hai tumne kiya vaada apna bhulaya hai tumne samache na maro musalman ho jao ali ko bulao akeli hai zehra rone pe pehra masaya ka sehra 
अकेली है जहरा बया किससे जाके करूं दर्द अपना है वैरों की दुनिया नहीं कोई अपना बया किससे जाके करूं दर्द अपना है वैरों की दुनिया नहीं कोई अपना कोई जाके बाबा से कह दो ये जाके के ले आओ आ अकेली है जहरा रोने पे पहरा मसाया का सहरा अकेली है जहरा लगते जिगर हसन ये नाना के पहलू में सोने न दे गए लगते जिगर हसन ये नाना के पहलू में सोने न दे गए तुम जाना पहलू में सो जाना मा के बकी में यहाँ पे अकेली है जहरा रोने पे पहरा मसाया का जहरा अकेली है जहरा शहे कर बलाने कहा रो के मासे ये मजलूम बेटे ने मजलूम मासे अकेला हूं मैं भी अकेली है जैदा अकेली है बाबा अकेली है जहरा रोने पे पहरा मसाया का सहरा अकेली है जहरा सरे मर्द कबाओगे बेटा खुदा के लिए अब ये पर्दा हटाओ चले आओ आओ अकेली है जहरा रोने पे पहरा मसाया का सहरा अकेली है जहरा कहा जाए आखिर बया बाह सू शिकस्ता है पहलू अकेली है जहरा موسیقی Brothers and sisters, Salaam Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Wa Alaikum Salaam Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. We'd like to introduce Sayyid Muhammad Bakr Al Qazmini. His uh, family is, as I mentioned before, is all ulama, mashallah. They uh, have big influence in Michigan area, especially in Devon Heights, and they have uh, influence in California too. Uh, so they've been teaching the Islam and teaching the the Quran and everything. So, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, because he gave us, MashaAllah, ulama to help us in countries like this country, uh, to help the, our kids 
to become Muslim and actually understand Islam instead of just saying we are Muslims. Uh, uh, before any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Sayyid Muhammad uh, to come to the podium and uh, lecture us. Salla ala Muhammad. جناب حجت القائم سرکار بلندتر سالوان اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم I begin in the name of the almighty God the compassionate, the merciful the one who has created everything in utmost perfection and may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved Messenger, the peak of His creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And His immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjallahu Ta'ala Farajah May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. It is truly my great honor to be here with you. After six months, my last visit was in October. It's refreshing to see many of you again. I have kept you in my du'as in the past few months, especially in the month of Ramadan and on the nights of Qadr. And I look forward to our program tonight with you. So tonight we have gathered to commemorate the tragic destruction of Jannat al baqir and to learn some very important lessons from this incident. And also since the Shahada, the martyrdom of the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Al Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as Sadiq sallallahu alayhi is coming up soon in a couple of weeks. We will also highlight some lessons that we learn from the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt. And tonight our program is also for Isad al-Thawab of the late uh, Al-Marhuma uh, Sayyida Atiya Nisreen. We have gathered to also dedicate our program to her soul. And I would like to offer my condolences on the one year anniversary of her passing to her respective family, to Dr. Sakina, to her grandson, our dear brother Salman. And we also dedicate our program to the souls of all the marhumin, all of your marhumin, inshallah tonight, we gift the thawab of our majlis to their souls. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ it's from the piety of the heart to glorify the signs and the symbols of God. 
About a century ago, in the year 1925, a tragic incident happened in one of the holiest sites in the religion of Islam. And that is in Jannat al -Baqir. Thank you, brother. In Jannat al -Baqir, there were shrines, constructions, domes, as you see in this picture, for the honorable members of Ahlul Bayt. We have four Imams of Ahlul Bayt buried in Jannat al -Baqir. The second Imam, Al Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam. You have the fourth Imam, Al Imam Zain al Abidin. The fifth Imam, Al Imam Al Baqir. The sixth Imam, Al Imam Al Sadiq, peace be upon them all. They are buried in this blessed cemetery. And this blessed cemetery occupies a very important significance in our Islamic history. When the Prophet moved to Medina, those early companions who passed away would be buried in the cemetery. It has been reported that the first companion from the Muhajirin, the migrants who migrated from Mecca to Medina, the first of them to be buried in Jannat al baqi was Uthman ibn Mad'un. Uthman ibn Mad'un was a decent companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet loved him very much. He died as a mu'min righteous. He was the first muhajir to be buried in Jannat al baqi Zurara ibn As'ad was the first from the Ansar, the residents of Medina to be buried in the cemetery. The Prophet had a rela special relationship with Jannat al baqi He had a daily habit where he would pass by Jannat al baqi and he would say salam to the souls of those who had passed away. Peace be upon you, O the people of La ilaha illallah. He would send his special salutations to them. Now, some people were confused. Who is the Prophet talking to? The Prophet made it very clear to his companions that these people who passed away, they can hear us. Don't think, and this is mentioned even in Bukhari, don't think that you can hear me better than they can hear me. They can hear us just like you hear us. The souls of those who pass away, they can hear what happens here on earth. So the Prophet had a special relationship with Jannat al baqi Nearly 10,000 companions are buried in the cemetery. So you, you can understand the, the history behind the cemetery. Once the commander of the faithful, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He built a room in Jannat al baqi Because around it, you had some houses, some rooms. So he built a room right next to it. Some people objected to him. They told him, oh Ali ibn Abi Talib, why are you building a small house here, a room here? You're now the neighbor of dead people. That's what they told him. You know what the Imam Ali Salam responded? Look at the response of Amir al Mu'mini. He says, I am the neighbor of the most truthful people. Look at the response of Amir al Mu'mini. And this is a reminder of how important it is to visit the cemetery. The Imam says, I am the neighbor of the most truthful people. Why? See, when you're alive, you can lie. I can manipulate, I can lie, I can deceive. That's what many people do, unfortunately. But the Imam says, once that person goes in their grave, that's the best lesson for us. They can't lie to you anymore. Their death tells you about this world. Their death tells you about the final destination. People who are in the cemetery, they are basically telling you, look, nothing can help me now from your world except my deeds. They're the best neighbors to have because they're truthful neighbors. They don't deceive you anymore. They teach you about the reality of this dunya and the reality of this life. So we have this rich history and unfortunately the extremist Wahhabis a century ago, they demolished, salamu alaykum, they demolished the blessed shrines in al baqi And in doing so, they were defying most Muslims. Do you know that most Muslims historically, not just the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, other Muslims, they would come to Jannat al baqi They would show respect to these shrines. Most Muslims historically from many schools of thought, 
They respected these tribes. It was this fringe group, the Wahhabis, the extremists, who decided to demolish, demolish it and to desecrate it. And in doing so, they insulted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is his family that's buried next to him. And the Quran says, in quoting the Prophet, the Prophet only asked for one thing from this Ummah. Show love for my family. Is that how you show? You show love to the family of the Prophet. To the grandchildren, to the descendants of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Is that the love that you show them? They desecrated the city of Medina. They insulted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They insulted the family of the Prophet, the righteous companions who are buried there. And so this is an act that we as Muslims, we must denounce. And we call on Muslim nations, the United Nations, activists, to advocate for the rebuilding of the Baqi. Because this is our history. You know, unfortunately, you go to other nations, they take pride in their monuments. Because those monuments preserve their values. But when you come to these holy sites, you see destruction. Whereas other nations show respect to their history and heritage. You see, unfortunately, these extremist people who call themselves Muslims causing destruction like that. This is very unfortunate. This is something that we all condemn and we reject, reject and we call on nations to pressure those in charge to rebuild the Baqiyah. This is a Muslim demand, not a Shi'i demand. Hundreds of Muslims around the world would like to see the Baqiyah rebuilt. And for visitors not to be harassed in Baqiyah, for you to go and continue the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ, when he would pass by and he would say his salams to those graves. We are upholding that tradition of our beloved Prophet. But these ignorant people, they want to impose their distorted version of Islam on many others. Now speaking about the Baqi and the domes, I would like to address one very important question here. Today there are people, even from the followers of Ahlul Bayt, who have an objection. They say, why is it that so much is spent on these shrines? If you go to Karbala, to Najaf, to Mashhad, you see golden domes. Isn't this a waste of resources, a waste of money? Shouldn't you give this money to the poor instead? I hear, I've heard some from people, if you stop funding these shrines, you will solve the issue of poverty. People won't be poor anymore. You can help youth get married who cannot afford to get married. And so this is a valid question that a lot of people are bringing forth. Do we have any evidence in our hadith that these you know, shrines should be constructed? And isn't it, isn't it a waste of resources? Can't you spend that on the poor? You go to some of these holy shrines and in the next alleyways you see poor people begging. Is this appropriate or no? I would like to address this very important question. My dear brothers and sisters, when you look at the issue of poverty, you realize that poverty has causes. It has political causes. It has economic causes. It has social factors. Constructing shrines is not one of the causes of poverty. I guarantee you today, if all these shrines are stopped, the funding stops, the operations stop, poverty will not be solved in, that, in those parts of the world. That's because poverty exists due to political injustice, due to social factors, due to economic conditions, not because there are people who donate to these shrines. And I guarantee you if you stop the funding of these shrines, poverty will continue to exist. There will still be poor people. There will still be youth who cannot afford to get married. So really, it's naive and ignorant to think that these shrines are the causes of poverty. These shrines have nothing to do with poverty. That's the first point. The second point, the poor people benefit significantly from these shrines. Do you know that many of these shrines have programs for the poor? I myself, I've seen it. I was in Karbala, it was during the winter. They were passing out blankets. To anyone who would stand in line and you would say, I need a blanket, they give you a blanket. They give you free meals. 
They fund charitable institutions like orphanages, hospitals for the poor. So a lot of the money that goes to these shrines is actually spent on the poor. This is something that these people don't tell you about. It's very important to consider that. The third point over here, many of these shrines have private sponsors. Some people think that when you fund these shrines, you're taking the bite from the mouth of the poor. Money is going to the poor, you stop it and you send it to the shrine. That might sometimes happen by a person who mishandles some funds. I don't deny that. I'm not telling you all the shrines are run in, in a very efficient and you know transparent way. There are bad apples everywhere, right? Here you could have a hospital and there are some people who do mismanagement. This is human nature, unfortunately. But we're talking about the overall system. Many of these shrines are funded by private donors. I remember about a decade ago, a businessman came to Karbala and the minaret of the shrine of Abel al Fadl Abbas السلام, was not gold. For those of you, if you remember going to Ziara 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was not golden. You had those like blue tiles. A businessman came. He said to the shrine, I would like to sponsor changing those tiles to golden tiles. It's on me. It's my private donation. On what basis are you allowed to refuse that? If a businessman comes and he says, I would like to sponsor that, Islamically, you don't have the right to stop him. He's giving money to this specific cause. You have to spend it on that specific cause. If you give me money to build a school, I go and build a hospital with it. It's haram in the law of God because I have been dishonest to the trust. I have to spend it the way the donor asks me to. I cannot change the funds just because, you know, I would like to, or even if there's a greater need. If someone gives you money to build a hospital, you're like, you know what, let me build an orphanage. There's a greater need for that. You need to get the permission from the donor. You can't do it by yourself without their permission. This is dishonesty, and the religion of Islam does not allow for that. So many of these shrines, they're actually funded by private donors. And I think it's helpful to realize that, to understand that. Now the fourth point. Do we have anything in our Islamic history that would authorize spending gold and silver on religious sites? Yes, absolutely. I'll take you back to the era of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Imam Ali alayhi salam sallu ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. After the conquest of Mecca, year 7 of the Hijrah, the Meccans, they embraced Islam, and Mecca officially entered the Islamic territories. Now, there were people who would come and they would give donations to the Kaaba. They would give private donations to the Kaaba. Sometimes the donation would be silver coins, golden coins, valuables, jewelry. Sometimes they would bring sheep, cows, whatever it is, and they donate it to the Kaaba. What did our Prophet do with those donations? The Prophet would only spend those donations on the Kaaba and Masjid al-Haram and the visitors. He would not take it to a, another project. He kept it for the Kaaba. You donate for the Kaaba, we keep it for the Kaaba and the pilgrims of the Kaaba. Who tried to change that? Come to the era of the second Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab. He tried to change that. He tried to take the valuables of the Kaaba and he wanted to spend it on the Muslim army. He said, there's a great need right now. We have a big army, we need to fund them. So I'm going to take these valuables and spend it on the army. Who stopped him? Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. The Imam called him out. He said, oh Umar ibn al-Khattab, on what basis are you doing that? Did the Prophet ever do that? He did not. The Quran does not authorize you to do that. The Sunnah does not authorize you to do that. You have to spend the valuables of the Kaaba on the Kaaba only, on Masjid al Haram. You can't use it to fund other operations. This was never approved by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And you cannot introduce something to religion that wasn't there. So the Imam made a beautiful case, by the way, this is documented in Shia hadith and Sunni hadith, Sunni sources, this incident. When Umar ibn al-Khattab heard the argument of Imam Ali alayhi salam, 
You know what he said? He basically said, may God not keep me for a dilemma in which there is no Abu al-Hasan to save me. He admitted. He told him, you make sense. I have no response to your argument. And so he did not use the resources on the army because the Imam, alayhi salam, he alerted him to this condition in Islamic law that you have to spend it on the Kaaba. So here we have an example of these valuables kept for the Kaaba, for the holy shrines, by the Prophet and by the Imam salam. And this is a precedent for us as well. Finally, my dear brothers and sisters, these shrines are an inspiration for millions of people. Why do you think people decorate these shrines? They spend on these shrines. Because these shrines have become religious monuments that remind you of the values of those who sacrificed their lives for Allah. And Allah says in the Holy Quran, Allah has signs. The Kaaba is a sign. These religious sites are signs. The Quran says the one who glorifies the signs of God, the signs that remind you of God, that remind you of the values of Quran and Sunnah, that is from the piety of the heart. The Holy Quran commands us to glorify the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this has a spiritual and psychological effect. Millions of people, when they walk to these shrines and they see the dome of Abba Abdullah al Hussein, what happens to them? Have, have you experienced that? If you've gone on Ziyara Arba'in and you're walking for two, three days, the minute you arrive Karbala and the first time you see the dome of Imam Hussein, you're transformed. Something happens to you. You feel the spirituality. These shrines have inspired people. They preserve our values. People go there, they learn about their deen, they come back strong, they come back with new energy and new passion. We cannot underestimate the role of these shrines in preserving our heritage, our values, our Islamic identity. Therefore, we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we are advocates of rebuilding these shrines in order to preserve that heritage. Today, Muslims, millions of Muslims go to this Baqiyah cemetery of course, they get harassed. You have like five minutes and then they'll kick you out. When they go there, they don't know the history behind these shrines. They have no clue. Who's Zayn al-Abideen? What's his legacy? Most Muslims outside of the school of Ahl al-Bayt, they don't know anything about these leaders in our history. Because these extremists have tried to bury their legacy. But when you have these constructed domes and shrines, people are inspired to ask. Who's buried there? Why are there four domes there? What do they represent? People are touched by their legacy. People are inspired by them. So that is why we call on the efforts to rebuild Jannatul Baqiyah. This great cemetery that occupies such an important place in our history. And to truly show respect for the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now, Towards the end, I would like to share with you some lessons from one of them who is buried from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, the last of them. The sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, because in a couple of weeks we shall be commemorating the martyrdom of Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. I'd like to share with you some quick lessons from the life of the Imam. You know, the one who really preserved the teachings of the Prophet and the teachings of Quran through his sciences, through his knowledge, was Al-Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli alayhi And interestingly, you will find that there is a quantitative miracle with the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt. What is this quantitative miracle? The miracle of quantity. My dear brothers and sisters, no figure in history has been coded as much as Al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. No king, no emperor, no philosopher has been coded and traditions have been attributed to him as much as the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt. Today, do you know how many hadiths have survived from Al Imam al Sadiq? Okay, maybe not all of them are accurate, authentic hadiths. Many of them are. But the point is, Look at the sheer size of narrations attributed to the Imam alayhi salam. 
you have more than 30,000 hadiths attributed to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq The book of Kafi only has 16,000 hadiths. Maybe 70% of them are from Imam al-Sadiq That is a quantitative miracle in an age where there were no cameras, copy machines. It was very difficult to preserve anything in writing. Over 30,000 narrations were heard by the Imam and they were documented. This is a quantitative miracle in our history. Show me a king from that era in which 30,000 statements have been attributed to him. No such thing exists in the history of humankind. No person has been given so much attention like Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Who, who in their life people were recording everything they were teaching and they were saying. Yes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is greater than Imam Sadiq. And the Prophet had many hadiths that people were documenting. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi went through so many trials. Many times he was in the battlefield defending the religion of Islam. And the Prophet was establishing a community. And so people were new to Islam. Unfortunately, many of the hadiths that the Prophet spoke were not preserved in history. Many of them, they were, they reached only a few people. Towards the end of Islam, people started joining Islam. But for nearly 20 years until the conquest of Mecca, the Muslims were very limited in their numbers. So a lot of the teachings of the Prophet did not survive in history. It's the Ahl al-Bayt who revived the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But look at this Imam, over 30,000 narrations attributed to him. And subhanAllah, his grandfather gives him the name of as sadiq the truthful. Because the Prophet knows that the Imam of Ahlul Bayt, who would be best positioned to teach others and narrate to them the teachings of Al Muhammad, would be Imam as sadiq would be Ja'far ibn Muhammad. So the Prophet gives him, gives him the title, As-Sadiq, the Truthful. So all Muslims know who Imam As-Sadiq is and how reliable he was. Through his sciences, he really transformed the world. Today, even if you look at the natural sciences, many of them trace their roots back to Imam As-Sadiq. Chemistry, when did chemistry started to develop? Through his student, Jabir ibn Hayyan. Jabir has authored more than 500 chapters in chemistry. And he directly took those lessons from al Imam Sadiq. Don't think Imam Sadiq was just teaching you, you know, fiqh and jurisprudence or tafsir of the Quran. He would teach sciences like chemistry, biology. Today there's a book that has survived. Alhamdulillah, we have a copy of it. It's called Tawheed Mufadlan. And Mufadlan was one of the companions of the Imam. The Imam gave him lessons in biology. Read it. The Imam talks about every body part. What does the liver do? What does the spleen do? What do the kidneys do? The Imam gives you a lesson, a, a, a lesson in biology, in medicine, astronomy. You know the Imam would teach some of his companions astronomy. The Imam السلام, would teach them anthropology, history. All these sciences, you find them in Al Muhammad. And the Imam السلام, was instrumental in conveying these sciences to the world. SubhanAllah, that's truly the blessings of the Ahlul Bayt. The amount of science you find in this household, you will not find in any other household. Starting from the Prophet and Amir al Mu'mineen all the way to the 12th Imam of Ahlul Bayt. They truly carried the sciences. Once, interestingly, during the time of Amir al Mu'mineen, السلام, just to show you how the Imams had a full grasp on science because Allah gave them that knowledge. Once a man came to the Imam السلام, Imam Ali السلام, and he said to him, look, I've made a nidr vow. I've made a religious vow, but I don't know how to fulfill it. The Imam said, what's the vow? He says, I made a vow that if my, you know, hajat, my request gets fulfilled, I will weigh an elephant I told him, come on, what kind of a vow is that? Be reasonable with your vows. You know, some people, uh, th that's their mentality. It's a vain thing to do, useless thing to do. But at the end of the day, he had a vow and he wanted to fulfill it. The Imam says, look, don't make such vows anymore. These are useless vows. What are you going to get out of weighing an elephant? What's that going to serve? 
However, now that you made this vow, I'll show you how to fulfill it. You said, how? How am I going to weigh an elephant? There's no scale that can handle that. Back then, right? Which scale is going to allow you to weigh an elephant? The Imam says, I have, an, I have a suggestion here. Go and bring a boat. When the boat is on the water, see where the water level reaches, put a mark. And then put the elephant on the boat. The boat is going to sink a little bit because it's heavy. See where the mark is now, the level of the water, mark it. Remove the elephant from the boat. Now bring weights. Because they had weights, like for instance, this would be 5 kilograms, or this would be 20 kilograms. Add weights to the boat until the water level reaches that mark. You'll know exactly how heavy the elephant is. SubhanAllah. How would the Imam, 14 centuries ago, really come up with this amazing way, which is a variation of Archimedes' principle? The Imam used a variation of it through science to discover something that's very simple. No one other than the Imams would know this in Arabia during those times. You see that the Imams had a command on all the sciences, but especially the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt. He was really instrumental in giving you these amazing sciences, but especially in Islamic law. Imam al-Sadiq when you read his law, his jurisprudence, all the four madahib, they go back to him. They were the leaders of the four other schools of thought, the Hanafis, Malikis, Hanbalis, Shafi'is. They were either direct students of an Imam al-Sadiq or the students of his students. He really shaped the history of Islamic law through beautiful concepts. The Imam alayhi salam, you find him giving you deep law. One of the laws of the Imam alayhi salam that I'd like to share with you just to look at the depth of the knowledge of the Imam is a law that we call in Arabic istishab. Istishab is the law of continuity. The Imam gave us a legal principle in which he states, do not negate certainty with doubt. Never negate certainty with doubt. Do you know today, Maraja and scholars extract thousands of rulings from this one statement? That's how many applications it has. That's how deep it is. I'll give you some brief examples. One, for instance, is about wudu and salah. Let's say at 12 p.m. you did wudu. You have certainty at 12 p.m. I did my wudu. At 4 p.m. you doubt. Did I break my wudu or no? Did I take a nap? Did I sleep? Did I use the bathroom? I don't remember. I know I did wudu, but I'm not sure if I broke my wudu or not. The imam was asked, what do I do in this case? The imam says, I'll give you a tool. Use this tool, you'll extract hundreds of laws from it. The Imam says, لا تنقض اليقين بالشك. Do not negate certainty with doubt. You have previous certainty at 12 p.m. you did wudu. Now you have a doubt, don't negate that certainty with this doubt. Which means consider yourself on wudu. This was a very simple application that the Imam السلام, gave. But you know scholars have extracted thousands of laws from this. I'll mention two brief ones. One is adala. If you know a person, he's just, he's trustworthy, you can pray jama'ah behind him, right? You doubt whether this person lost their adala or no. Let's say this person went on a vacation to Cancun, Mexico, and you're like, I don't know what this person was doing there. <laughs> it's questionable, I don't know. Maybe he had a halal vacation, maybe not, I don't know. It's possible. So you have a doubt. For whatever reason, due to rumors, you start having a doubt. Did this person lose their adana? Are they still just, I can break behind them, they could be a witness in divorce? Because you know, adana has many applications. What does the hadith of the Imam state? Don't negate certainty with doubt. You know for sure this person two months ago was just. You could pray behind him, you could accept him as a legal witness in Islamic law. Now you've heard some rumors, you don't know if they're true or not. You don't know. You have a doubt. The Imam says, don't negate that certainty with doubt. Still consider your friend to be trustworthy and adil and go and pray behind him. See, look at the wisdom in the school of Ahlul Bayt. So this is one example. Another example that scholars and maraja today have used is fish that we could consider as halal. Because you know for fish to be halal in Islamic law, 
The fish has to die where? Inside the water or outside? Outside the water. If a, di if a fish dies on its own inside the water, it's not halal anymore. You cannot eat it. It has to die outside of the water. So you catch it, it dies outside of the water, then it would be halal. Now if you're buying fish from a Muslim market, you don't have to investigate. We have hadiths that tell you anytime you buy something from Muslims, consider it to be halal. But let's say you buy fish from a non-Muslim market. How do you know this fish that you're buying? For instance, you're buying salmon. How do you know this fish died in the water or outside the water? How do you know? If it's outside the water, it's halal. If it's inside the water, it's haram. I don't know. It's not a Muslim for me to say, okay, I have Islamic laws that tell you you're buying meat from a Muslim, just consider it halal. You're buying it from a non-Muslim company. So how can I verify it's halal? Use the law of continuity. The maraja have said, and this is how their application. See how technical our legal system is and how detailed it is. Let's appreciate it. So the scholars will tell you, look, this fish, at one point, it was alive. You have yaqeen, certainty, that it was alive. You don't know when it was pulled outside the water. Was it alive or was it dead? The imam says, don't negate certainty with doubt. You have certainty it was alive. Now continue that certainty up until the moment it was extracted from the water. You have a doubt. Did it, was it dead or not? The imam says ignore this doubt. Just continue that previous certainty and assume it to be alive when it was taken out. For legal purposes, you can consider it to be halal. Look at this beautiful application. Thousands of fatwa from your maraja and their books come from one statement, four words. From Al Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad a thousand three hundred years ago. La tanqad al yaqeena bil shak. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Don't negate certainty with doubt. Look at the knowledge of Al Muhammad. It's truly inspirational. And then when you come to the theology of the Imam, the ma'rifah of God, you know the Imam would have debates with atheists in Masjid al Haram. You know, today. A non-Muslim is not even allowed to enter these places, right? Today, if you're not a non-Muslim, they won't let you enter Mecca and Medina. But look at the era of the Imam, alayhi salam. The Imam would have debates with atheists in Masjid al-Haram. I've not seen one hadith where the Imam says, Hey, you atheists, get out of here. I'm not going to talk to you. Look at the openness of Ahlul Bayt. Look at the rahmah, the inclusivity. The atheist would come to Masjid al-Haram. He would give his objections. Imam says, let me finish my tawaf. Wait, I'll come. Let's debate. Let's talk about the existence of God. The Imams would have dialogue with everyone, even with their enemies, even with those who rejected God, even with atheists. One day, an atheist comes to the Imam. The Imam السلام, tells him, You reject the existence of God? He said, Yes. So the Imam السلام, asks a follow up question. He's having a debate about the existence of God. The Imam tells him, so are you created or you're not created? Are you created or you're not created? The atheist says, no, I'm not created. The Imam says, okay, I have a question for you. If you were created, how would you look like? Theoretically, try to visualize yourself being created. How would you look like? So the atheist, he starts thinking, he's brainstorming. He says, well, if I was created, I'd have depth, I'd have texture, there'd be colors, you know, I'd have a body. He begins to describe exactly how this life is. The Imam السلام, says, well, everything that you described is applicable right now. You have depth, you have volume, everything you said. So why aren't you created? <laughs> At that point, he froze. He's like, I've never seen it that way. This... Simple statement made him believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. That your grandfather is the messenger of Allah and you're the hujjah of God on earth. Here's, here's another very powerful one. Once I used it on the plane, I'll share with you that incident. It's, today it's called Pascal's Wager. But really, it comes from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. An atheist comes, the Imam is having a dialogue with him. He keeps rejecting, he's being stubborn. Finally, the Imam, when he realizes he's being stubborn, is like, look, let me ask you one final question. If it turns out that there's no God, and I got it wrong, and you got it right, 
just for the sake of argument, if it turns out that there is no God, me and you are equal. We're both going to die. We'll become dust. You say there's no akhirah, no day of judgment. Nothing, nothing. When you die, you become dust. Okay, I spent my life worshipping God. Turns out there's no God. I'll become dust. And you're going to become dust. What's the difference between us? I didn't lose anything. Because when you're dust, you're just dust. Who cares what you did in your life? The ending is the same. So if there is no God, I haven't lost anything. But if it turns out there is a God, and he had laws, and he has a system, and there was a trial, and there is a day of judgment. I, who worshipped God, I'll be saved. What will happen to you if there is a God? The atheist starts to shake. <laughs> when he uh, hears this reality this way, the Imam says, look, in both cases, I'm the winner here. If there is no God, I've got nothing to lose. But if there is a God, you've got everything to lose. So what does the intellect tell you? The intellect tells you, take this seriously, believe in God. Today, this is called Pascal's Wager where it's attributed to a Christian scholar who supposedly discovered it, but he didn't. Pascal came way after an Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. It actually goes back to the sixth Imam of Ali Bayt. If you think this argument is for the old times, it doesn't work today, think twice. Years ago, I was, going, I was coming back uh, from Canada the day after Eid. I had a program for the month of Ramadan. And this... Lady was on the plane, so she saw my attire, she asked what it was about. So she told me, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. I, my family's Christian, but I gave up my faith in God. So I gave her some proofs for the existence of God. The last one that I gave her is this argument by the Imam a.s. I told her, look, if it turns out there's no God, I haven't lost anything. Okay, I spent my life worshipping God, serving God. When I'm dust, who cares? I haven't lost anything. But if it turns out there is a God, what do you think is going to happen? You should have seen the look on her face. She, she basically said, I'd be miserable if that would be the case. I told her, so your intellect, what does your intellect teach you? What should you do? She says, my intellect tells me to believe in God. Of course, I'd given her other scientific evidence. At that point, she said, if, if this is the case, I will believe in God. Look at the argument of the Imam 13 centuries ago. Use it with a person on the plane and they subhanAllah will accept it. That's the nur and the barakah and the words of Ahlul Bayt. Then she asked me a question, a follow-up. It's like, okay, okay, intellectually I get it. There's a creator. How can I feel God's presence? Where is he? It's a beautiful question. Where is he? I told her, let me give you an example from the Quran. She's like, what's that example? I told her right now on the plane, of course, I had to kind of lower my voice because you're on the plane, Muslim. You don't want to spook anyone, <laughs> scare anyone. I told her, if right now there's engine failure, you know, the plane's about to crash in 30 seconds. Imagine the pilot tells you, hey, sorry, I have bad news. We're going to crash in 30 seconds. Just try to visualize the plane about to crash. Like You're going to die in 30 seconds. Try to close your eyes and visualize it. Do you feel in your heart there is a power that can save you? She closed her eyes. She went with the exercise. She said, yes, I feel that in my heart. I told her that's God. That's the presence of Allah. He's put in your fitra, in your innate nature. Allah's closer to you than your own jugular vein. He's there. You just felt his presence. She started to cry. She started to cry when she heard this. When she heard this. But then she was smart. She had a PhD. She told me, you said this examples from the Quran. Back then there were no planes. So how is this from the Quran? <laughs> I told her I modified it. The Quran talks about a ship. When they go on board the ship and the ship is about to drown, they pray to God, save us. But when Allah saves them, they forget about their creator. I just modified it and I used it for a plane. But the essence of the example is in the Quran. She started to cry and she says, I believe in this God. SubhanAllah, even Allah puts his ma'rifa in you. He puts his ma'rifa in your heart. Atheists, even though they reject God deep down, they know there is a creator. The University of Finland, um, Helsinki, the University of Helsinki in Finland, they actually did a study. They bought atheists and they told them, you don't believe in God? They said, no, we're sure God doesn't exist. It's just a fairy tale. They said, okay, we have an exercise. Basically, they put these... Uh, uh, you know, detectors on their fingers 
to detect fear. So they told them, wear this. Now we're going to challenge you to do something. They said, okay, what? They said, you see that rock there? Dare this rock to hurt your parents. You love your parents? Yes. Challenge this rock. Say, I challenge this rock to hurt my parents. And they started laughing. What is this rock going to do to my parents? So, you know, they, no fear was shown using the device. They said, okay. You sure God doesn't exist? They said, yes, it's a fairy tale. They said, okay, say, I dare God to hurt my parents. Guess what happened this time? They were hesitant to say it, and the device showed there was fear in their body. Because when you're in the state of fear, your brain releases certain hormones. You can detect that. They detected those hormones that indicate fear. They told them, wait a minute, I thought God was a fairy tale just like that rock. Why did you hesitate to say it? Subhanallah, Allah puts his mouth in your heart. Allah is closer to us than we think, my dear brothers and sisters. He's there. There's a trial. He's there. I know some people say, where is God? I don't feel him. He's abandoned me. A person once said, I don't feel the presence of God. I feel like I believe in God, but I feel like he's left me. Allah has never left you. We leave God sometimes through our sins, through our ignorance. But Allah doesn't leave us. Allah tries us. See, you can have the best professor and teacher at school. He will dedicate time to teach you the material in the best way. I know some school, some teachers, they stay after school to tutor their kids because they really care about their education. But when you come to your final exam on that day, is your teacher going to sit next to you and give you the answers? No, because there's no wisdom in that. The good teacher is not the one who sits and gives you the answers. That's cheating. What's the point of that? There's no wisdom in that. A good teacher is the one who gives you the tools to do well on your exam. This life, 70 years, is an exam. Don't expect miracles every single second for Allah to show you. That defeats the purpose. Allah has given you all the tools to pass your exam. But He's there. He's right there. He's next to you. But it requires faith. It requires Iman. It requires good akhlaq, humbleness, acceptance of the system of Allah. And so we find the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt. He truly inspires us with the ma'rifah of Allah, with the knowledge of Allah, to worship Allah and to feel honored that you're worshiping your Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And truly when you look at the teachings of the Imam and you implement them, you will feel at peace, my dear brothers and sisters. In one hadith, the Imam says, when you're interested in the materialism of this dunya, you'll never have peace of mind. Your heart will not be at peace. But once you become indifferent to this world, you know where your destination is. At night, believe me, you will sleep peacefully. You know how a believer sleeps? A believer says, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Maybe I'm going through a crisis, family problem, financial problem. Look, we're all tested. We all have our pain. But a believer, when he sleeps, he says, I don't know what tomorrow will happen. But I do know one thing. I have a merciful Lord who will take care of me. A Lord who knows more than I do. Who's more compassionate than I am. I'll submit my case to him. Let him figure out the future for me. The future is not your domain. Don't worry about the future. What you own is today, right now, this hour. It's time to work, go and work. It's time to pray, pray. It's time to eat with your family, eat with your family. Do your obligation. Don't worry about tomorrow and next week and next month. I know some people, they get depressed, they become suicidal. What's happening to my life? What's happening six months from now, a year from now? Don't burden yourself with these thoughts. You have a Lord who's controlling the whole universe. He can't fix your life. Look at the galaxies. Today scientists tell us the universe is 90 billion billion with a B light years across. Every atom knows what it's doing in this universe inspired by God. Have you ever heard from a scientist telling you there's an atom that's confused today? An atom woke up in the morning, it doesn't know should it spin left or right? The electrons should go this way or that way. Everything knows exactly what it's doing. Trust this Lord. He has a system. Allah's micromanaging the whole universe. You can't fix your life. Believe in his power. Believe in his mercy. And that's why we have the blessed Quran. Why does the Quran give you stories? Just to entertain you? The Quran gives us stories.
to inspire us, to show us that Allah indeed will take care of you. The most complete story we have in the Quran is the story of Prophet Yusuf Why do you all love this story? Because of the lessons in it. See, the first 40 years of the life of Prophet Yusuf were miserable. Miserable. I mean, if, if, if you just see his life until age 40, you're like, oh Allah, why did you create Yusuf? What is the wisdom in that? His brothers gang up on him. They beat him. They try to kill him. They throw him in a well. Then they sell him as a slave. Can you imagine your own brothers that you looked up to? You think they defend you? They sell you as a slave. And then he goes to Egypt. And then the whole predicament with Zulaikha starts. And then seven years in prison. Where is Allah? Allah shows you his presence. Wait, be patient. Don't judge a movie before you finish watching it. If you're watching your best movie at minute 40, you stop it. That's not fair. You can't say this is a lousy movie. The producer will tell you, hey, see it till the end. See the movie till the end. And then after that, my dear brothers and sisters, you see how Allah compensated Prophet Yusuf. SubhanAllah, after the age of 40, he became the minister in Egypt. Allah reunited him with his brothers, with his parents. Allah will take care of you. The life is a trial. Be patient. And that's truly what we learn from the wisdom of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. But the Imams, my dear brothers and sisters, they had to sacrifice. Let's be close to the Ahlul Bayt. Let's learn from their sacrifices. Tonight, as we are also commemorating the loss of our dear sister, Sayyida Atiyah Nasreen, and this majlis is for the Isal of Thawab for her soul, I was told by her family, by her respected uh, daughter, Dr. Sakina, how she loved the Ahlul Bayt. She was always committed to the Ahlul Bayt, to the majalis of Ahlul Bayt. It's through your humanity that you learn from the Ahlul Bayt that you can touch other people. Many people were inspired by her. Many people would call her mother, mommy. When she passed away, many people would say to her family, now there is no one to call me and check upon me. No one to cook for me when I'm ill. This is the spirit of Ahlul Bayt, the spirit of giving, the spirit of generosity, her commitment to her children, to her grandchildren. She had a lot of love for her children. And yes, she did struggle from a terminal illness. But as her family told me, she never lost her faith in Allah. So the last moment, she would say, Allahu Akbar. She'd remember the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She wouldn't complain and be angry with God. God, why am I going through this? She accepted it. And in fact, she said, I wish to gift the remaining of my life to my family. That's the spirit of generosity. Hold on to the Ahlul Bayt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the best quality of life. But the Ahlul Bayt, they had to really endure a lot of difficulties, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's take our hearts to the tragedies of Ahlul Bayt in this moment. You know, once the house of Imam al-Sadiq was attacked, the enemy stormed in. They set some of the rooms to fire. The Imam saw the children, the women going from one room to another room, trying to cover themselves, trying to protect from self, themselves from the fire. Later, one of the companions of Imam Sadiq saw the Imam crying. The Imam was heartbroken for what happened. This man comes to Imam Sadiq. He tells him, Sayyidi, my master. Why do I see you crying like that? You're from the Ahlul Bayt. You're used to these tragedies. Why did you cry like that? I know you're patient. You're the leader of patience. You show us how to be patient. Why did you cry so much? The Imam alayhi salam told me to, he responded to him. The Imam told him, you misunderstood me. I did not cry because my house was attacked. I cried because when I saw my women and children going from one room to another room, I remembered the women and children of Karbala after my grandfather Hussein was martyr. And the enemies, they came and they attacked their tents and they set their tents to fire. Those women and those young children 
they would be running barefoot on the plains of Karbala from one tent to another tent, running for their lives. I remembered that scene. I remembered that tragic story. That's why I started to cry. The Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, whenever they go through difficulty and tragedies, they would always remember the tragedy of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Because there's no day like Ashura. No tragedy in history happened like the tragedy of Karbala. So you find your beloved Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he would constantly think about his aunt Zainab and what happened to her in Karbala. How the children were attacked in Karbala. How the children were harassed in Karbala. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين. Raise your hands in dua, my dear brothers and sisters. This is the moment of dua when you gather as believers. Allah, He looks at you with mercy. Allah accepts your duas. Raise your hand. Let's recite this holy verse five times together so that Allah subhanahu wa taala. Grants to you your hajat. I know people who are ill, they've asked us for dua. This is the moment of dua. So everyone together, raise your hands. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله نسألك اللهم باسمك العز لا جل الأكرم يا الله 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 والله هيستن the reappearance of our master الإمام المهدي والله make us amongst the sincere and dedicated servants oh Allah all those who are ill and they've asked us for dua grant them a speedy recovery O oh Allah, grant us our hajat. O oh Allah, grant us the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein. O oh Allah, grant us the ziyarah of the Prophet and the Imams of Baqi. O oh Allah, grant us the shafa'ah of the Ahl al Bayt alayhim as And we dedicate our majlis. Let's recite Surah al Fatiha for the souls of the marhumin with a very loud salawat. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you.